Good evening. Tonight's discussion is about politics and art, and our guest is Comrade Alan Woods, a Marxist political theoretician from UK, who has been active in labor movement for over 60 years. Also with us is Comrade Hamid Alizadeh from IMT, International Marxist Tendency. Thank you, comrades, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, it is a difficult task to introduce Alan Woods in a few sentences, since uh, he has been active for so long. But let me try by saying that he has written books and articles on a variety of subjects related to Marxism. Comrade Woods studied uh, in Sussex University and later in Sofia, Bulgaria, and Moscow State University, Philosophy and Russian Language. He participated uh, in the movement against Franco's dictatorship in late 1970s and has recently published his book Spain's Revolution Against Franco, The Great, uh, the Great Betrayal, about those events. Uh, he has written books and articles on a variety of subjects such as Bolshevik Revolution, arts, philosophy and modern science. Uh, Reason in Revolt, Marxist Philosophy and Modern Science is the title of a book he co-authored with Ted Grant, uh, which has been translated into Farsi by Savar Savarnia and published by Jarf Publication in Tehran. Uh, our comrade Shirin, uh, chief editor in Exit Theatre, has translated a number of his works into Farsi. Uh, Shirin Jan, would you say which books you, you translated from Alan? Yes, uh, Art and Class Struggle. Um, 400 years since the 400 death. years since the death of Shakespeare, a revolutionary in literature and capitalist fetishism and the decay of art. And the, and also, ideas um, the ideas of Karl Marx. Right. Uh, Comrade Woods, uh, you have shown a particular interest in art and its ties to the class struggle and politics. Your attention to art, uh, not your personal interest, but rather your interest as a politician, has been very interesting for us. So we would like to hear, hear you elaborate on the matter, please. Well, first of all, it's a, a great honor and a pleasure for me to be pre present in, in such an important country as, as Iran and at such an important moment in world history, which we are living through a period now of fundamental change, revolutionary change, I would say. And revolution, of course, is, is implicit in this situation. And, of course, the question that arises, uh, what is the place of art in revolution, in this in movement, what's the role of, of artists and writers and so on? Above all, in Iran. Now, first of all, I think that for Iran, I think that's a strange question, if you will forgive me, because art and literature and music have always been, as you know, a fundamental element of Iran's, uh, Persia's history, culture, traditions. I would go so far as to say it's probably in the DNA of the Persian people, and the day that that would be lost would be a very sad day. And therefore, that's the defense of culture, you see. I consider that to be an integral part of our revolutionary work. Why do I say this? Well, look, uh, in the Bible it says, you know, man does not live by bread alone. Of course, he was referring to the religious sense of religion. I'm not referring to that. But yes, human beings do not only live for, for material things. Uh, the, the, the idea, for example, that it's just a question, you can reduce the class struggle and revolution just to the struggle for higher wage and better conditions. Of course, that's very important. Extremely important. People of Iran and of England and so on must struggle to live, must struggle against capitalist exploitation and oppression. That's perfectly true. Yes, but is that enough? I don't think so. I don't think so. You could say, although I am a materialist and therefore I am not a religious person at all, but it is possible to speak about man's and women's spiritual needs. You know, there are other things, higher things. As a matter of fact, the struggle for socialism 
which is a struggle for a higher form of human civilization. It's a struggle, I'll tell you what, it's a struggle to be, to be able to forget about material things. Socialism, if a social society, a harmonious society based upon a, a planned democratic production, would guarantee a job for everybody, a, suitable, a reasonable standard of living, a house, you know, ev everyone should be guaranteed these things. Good heavens, above. these are elementary things, the elementary human rights, the right to live. Yes, but once you have those things, what does that mean? It means that people will be genuinely free. You talk about freedom, is, 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 the word freedom is bandied around. It doesn't mean very much. It doesn't mean very much to be free, formally free. If you, you, your life is reduced to a, an animal struggle for existence, that's not genuine freedom. That's a form of slavery. And the minds of, of, of most people, I think, in both in Iran and in this country, it's the same thing. The minds of people it, it, is obsessed with the struggle for existence, the bare struggle, you know, will I be able to pay my rent at the end of the month? Will I be able to pay my debts? Will I be able to feed my children and so on? Will I be able to find a school? If I fall sick, will I be able to be attended to and so on? Now, these are the things which, which occupy people's minds to a large extent. In the United States, for example, it's a, a, allegedly a free country. What sort of freedom? I wouldn't like to comment on, but nevertheless, formally people are free. In order to exist, American workers must work not just one job, two or three jobs, just in order to exist. So, so what's life? If it's just work, eat, sleep, work again, that's not life. That's not genuine human existence. Socialism would guarantee all these things, and that that's the point. That would genuinely free, for the first time in 10,000 years, it would free men and women, ordinary men and women, if you like, to raise their horizons, to look, look, look at the stars, look at the skies. You know, Aristotle, the great uh, Greek uh, philosopher, he once said a very profound thing. He said, man begins to philosophize when the needs of life are provided. He said that. He said that. Philosophize means to think of the big things, not, even, not the trivial small things, to think of the big ideas, the important things in human life. And he went on to say, consequently, consequently, uh, mathematics and astronomy were discovered in Egypt because the priest did not have to work. Now, I sort of said that, just imagine, for 2,000 years ago. Now, that remains true today. It's true today. The purpose of socialism is to grant freedom for people to develop their personality. Everything that's inside them now, we, uh, I must make one thing clear. There's many caricatures of communism and socialism. Oh no, people are not all the same. Of course people are not all the same. People are not born all the same. People have different genetic makeup, different aptitudes, different uh, capacities. Yes, but everything, everyone, every human being on this planet as some spark of individuality within themselves, within their hearts, within their souls, if you like, that aspire to something higher than just mere animal existence, if you like. That's the real function. That's what, that's what we are fighting for. And the problem of, of capitalism in, in, in this period above, or the period of its decay, which we are living now, in, in, in the terminal, in my opinion, the terminal decay of capitalism, it threatens everything. It doesn't just, not just threatens the, the, the livelihoods and the jobs, good God, they're now talking about the fact that this present crisis, this coronavirus uh, crisis, will end up with half, they, they say this, half the world's population will be unemployed. That means starvation for millions of people. That's the real future that capitalism offers us. But even if, if, if you have a job and sort of, you're still reduced to this kind of slave existence. You're not really free to develop yourself. Part of our task, I would say an important task, is to fight for culture, fight for civilization, fight for whatever democratic rights that we've managed to, to obtain. And in Iran, that's not very many. That, that is, a, a, is another fight that must be won, the fight for democratic rights and so on. Yeah, but there's also the, the, the struggle for culture which capitalism threatens. Capitalism, really speaking, is hostile by its very nature. 
reducing everything to the question of cash and money and profits and so on. And so forth. You know, to reduce everything. I think uh, Oscar Wilde, the famous Irish playwright, uh, you must have heard of Oscar Wilde, a wonderful writer, uh, he once said, the definition of cynicism, a cynic, he said, is a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And that's it. Now, therefore, it is important, and art plays an important role. Incidentally, I would make a more general observation. You know, there is, there is something about art which is inherent to the human, to our humanity. It goes right back. Art has existed as long as our species has existed. People have always striven for, for this thing, for this, which was important, you know, at, at certain times in, for most people. Unfortunately, with the development of class society for the last 10,000 years, art has become the property of a tiny minority. As long, I think Engels once said this, as long as art, science and government are the property of a small minority, that minority will abuse its uh, position, its monopoly in its own, its own interest. The p position now, however, is that once the working class will take power and will organize society on a rational, genuinely human basis, if you like, art would cease to be, and culture would cease to be the monopoly of a small minority to become the property of everybody, of the whole of society. And therefore, that, that itself implies a great uh, cultural revolution, not what you had in China, of course, that was a, an abomination, but genuine, uh, uh, where people genuinely would be free to develop themselves, all the capacity that they have, which is not the same, there'd be some, you know, Trotsky once said, you know, once said, he said, well, how many Aristotles are herding swine, uh, are keeping pigs, you know, how many Aristotles are herding swine, he said, and he added, and how many swine herds are sitting on thrones? He added that. The capitalist system is colossal, class society is colossally wasteful. Your own country, I'm sure, has got plenty of uh, capacity to do, for people to develop themselves, not necessarily as artists. Some of them could be great artists. Some of them could be great writer, writers. Some of them could be great doctors, teachers, dancers, scientists, mathematicians, all kinds of but this talent is lost. It's trampled out, it's crushed out of people. People's, not, not just people's lives are crushed by capitalism, their souls are crushed. And art is crushed. Art becomes just one other commodity, same as any other commodity, you know. Great works of art, you know. Maybe the case in point, the great painter Goya, one of the, the, the bigger part, uh, the Dutch uh, the painter, uh, my mind has gone blank. Um, name him, the great D Dutch Dutch painter. I can Bosch. see Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old, I'm getting old. Van Gogh, one of my favorite painters, a great, by the way, a great revolutionary, a great uh, progressive. Do you know how many paintings he sold during his lifetime? One to his brother. To his brother, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't sell any painting. Right. And now, of course, one of these paintings, if one of these paintings, if they were ever put on sale, they would be millions and millions and millions. Then they'd be purchased by whom? In the old days, in the, the Renaissance, they'd be purchased by wealthy merchants who would show off their paintings and so on. No, 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 no. They're bought by anonymous uh, businessmen in New York and Tokyo and so on. And they disappear in, into a bank vault where they're hidden as an investment. This, this, my friends, is the death of art. Look at the nearer to your home, nearer next door to Iran, Iraq, with all its wonders, its museums, and so on and so forth, the, the cradle of civilization and so on. The American appeals were stormed into Iraq, the so-called defenders of culture and civilization. Look, they went on the rampage, destroying museums. These priceless works of art have been lost to humanity because of these gangsters, these plunderers and so on. So yes, capitalism and imperialism are, are a deadly threat. I would say, not just to the working class, not just from a material point of view, even biological, you know, if the capitalist system, this coronavirus crisis proves it. If this criminal system is allowed to exist for 
a few decades more. Well, Marx said that the choice before us was what socialism or barbarism. That's what he said, and that was correct. There are elements of barbarism already that exist throughout the world in all countries. There's elements of barbarism. Yes, but we can go further than that now because of the advances of technology and so on, which on the one hand present a dazzling picture of the future. You know, I mean, very often as a Marxist, I'm accused of being, oh, you, you, you. Utopians, you know that you you this cannot be, and it doesn't. It's not real. On the contrary, what's utopian about it? For God's sake, what's the utopian about using the, the, the colossal capacity of science and technology, of uh, information and of, uh, of all, all kinds of this mar- robots, for example, robots, which could could free people from work altogether, more or less. But under capitalism, that means mass unemployment and so on. And of course, these discoveries, but that's the frightening side, you know. This irresponsible system, which everything is, is dominated by profits, you know, they're playing around with, with microbes and, 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 and goodness knows, and diseases and so on, chemicals. Look at the way they're poisoning the oceans with, with plastic. If this criminal system is allowed to exist for a few decades more, it, we, it would really pose a threat to the existence of the human race. Right. And therefore, Revolution, by which I mean a fundamental change in society, is necessary. It's a matter of life and death. It is necessary. And part of that, to come back to your original question, an important part of that is the struggle, if you like, for the soul of humanity, for its spirituality and for, and for art, which, of course, plays, has always played a fundamental role. And in the future, social society will play an even bigger role, of course, than ever before. Okay, thank you. Comrade Hamid, do you have something to add? I mean, it's, a, it's very difficult to come right after. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we said that situation. you go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Try. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think that definitely, as Alan said, capitalism does play uh, a, a very reactionary role in all fields, in science as well as in art. And uh, we definitely see, in my opinion, everywhere a... Um, decay basically within the artistic world uh especially in in the fine arts so to say in arts which in in um, arts which have been developed for hundreds and even thousands of years such as you know classical music painting all of these things uh they've been completely uh gutted basically all the essence of, of art and expression which was which was coming from without from within these uh, fields uh, in, a, in the general term, at least, in the broadest sense of the word, have, have completely been destroyed. And what we see is actually a very reactionary uh, uh, string, uh, strand within art, which is the creeping in of postmodernism into art, basically. In every field of, of modern art that, that we see, we see the postmodernism that, that nothing really matters, there's no point, there's no progress in history, there's nothing worth fighting for, there's, <laughs> everything is just uh, you know, uh, dissolved basically, and um, and we see that obviously, as I said, e- even in classical music, there's there's no good classical music. If had, no one has made good classical music for decades, uh, uh, in, in paintings and so on, everything is just and this question of pop culture, pop art, has came out in these so-called theories of pop art, which is you know an art for the masses, they call it. But that really is an arrogant way of seeing it. It's basically like, uh, the idea is we dilute all art, we empty it completely out, and then we make it as shiny as possible so we can dangle it in front of people's eyes and hypnotize them, like you would with a, with a child that's crying, basically. That's, that's the view of, and, and these people dominate really a huge part, if not uh, all of the, 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 the art world. Uh, and I think it is a reflection of the dead end of capitalism in itself, and I think when, when you know when we say people are not interested in art, I think this is this is the type of art that people are gen, you know dom- mainly not interested in. There is, is meaningless art, which which has no struggle behind it. There's no worth for it. No one has actually put any effort, real effort, into it, and therefore people treat it with the same contempt. You know, they buy it one day, they li- they listen to a song and throw it out because it's it's not worth more than that. And then you see you know, the rise and fall of, the, of these random uh, musical trends and so on. 
is, is based on that. Uh, also, obviously, there is still art uh, from previous eras, which is extremely valuable. I think, uh, well, there's lots of, you know, the cultural heritage of, of humanity. But I think also there's a systematic attempt of re reducing or at least not uh, uh, allowing access to this art. Because art, art is not just something, obviously, you can see it. You go to a museum, you can, nowadays you have access to lots of things via the internet and so on. But, uh, but people are not taught, taught <laughs> to understand art, the history behind art, the logic behind art, the, 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 the laws of art, uh, so to say. And therefore, uh, you know, there's like a dumbing down of things almost, like in, in a lot of uh, education, universities and schools. Uh, to understand the depth of art is looked at with contempt even, even in the education system. And that obviously is another barrier for people to actually have access, in my opinion, to real art. On the other hand, I think there are, uh, I mean, in a country like Iran, I think this is also, this is very uh, uh, obvious, is that there are millions of people who are interested in art and who want to create art and millions of, especially middle class Iranian, but all kinds of, in Iran is a very broad thing, but everywhere in the world today, people have access to new technology, for instance, of making music and poetry and art, you know, writing things. Um, but this kind, this culture that, that is, that exists amongst a lot of, especially young people, we see it in revolutionary movements, is not, is disconnected from the historical process of art, I would say. That is disconnected from enormous, all of the experience that previous uh, uh, methods of art in, in all kinds of fields have brought with it. It's completely disconnected, and there's people basically trying to reinvent the, the real and losing out on a lot of things. So there's the, the vigor, and I would say the vigor and the enthusiasm for art is present, and we see it everywhere, especially amongst the youth. But all the paths to towards this art uh, in, in a genuine way is, is blocked off. So that's my okay. Just you know, great. But uh, comrades, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Kamija. Uh, Kamra, I would ask if I may, if it could be more concrete. Uh, the good thing is that we are all agree on these things you said. <laughs> we are in a safe place. But uh, let me let me ask you, and I want Shirin also to help me. Let's go back to UK and ask uh, you both as 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 politicians. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, you, Alan, uh, became uh, Minister of Culture in the UK, right? Mm. And also you have Hamid with you there. <laughs> and and, and uh, I would that, really like... That would be a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, have the government exactly the way you want, right? And you have the power. And... Uh, I would like to ask uh, concretely, based on some uh, facts and data Shirin would give us about, let's say, theater in UK, now how it is and how it works. What would you do? What would you do differently? Right? It's great. We, ju we just all know these uh, great ideas. It's just right there. But one, what in uh, reality, what we could do? Shirin Jung, if, uh, if it's possible... I su my suggestion is that sure. uh, first to hear the data uh, and uh, also some facts, and then please, if you, comrades, could just say what you could do, make it better. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't get into the details, to small, small, small details, but let me just point out that um, the report released by uh, Art Council England in 2016 this report suggests that uh, reductions in public funding post-2004 have accelerated since um, 2010. Yeah. Since then, very few regional venues could justify a claim to be profitable. Yeah. And most of the central and local government subsidies were removed. The result is a mixed economic sector um, in which private sources of income uh, has come to the fore. This report suggests that 86% um, of the finance at work in the theater industry stems from the private sector. There has been concerns about um, diversity of the audience since many theaters had to raise their ticket prices 
to increase their income and make up for the lack of public funding, which has resulted in leaving out a large part of population in theater audience. Mm -hmm. That also leads to decreasing income of theater workers, fewer and smaller production in uh, local, regional, and uh, national theaters and less rehearsal time, raised ticket prices, reductions in diverse productions and um, outreach work. Mm. Also, the uh, little public funding that remains mostly goes to the profitable theatres, which leads to their increasing growth while others have hard time making ends meet. That uh, sums up the situation of theatre in England. Yeah, I that's that is that is the, the way when we theater people coming to your you know office in the government and say, okay, this is what <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is the, exactly our point is that actually you politicians could help us to to solve the problem, and what would you do? Well, first of all, I am not a politician; I am a revolutionary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> even better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the only way that I, I see you've got Lenin in the background, uh, she, very good. Yeah, you're <laughs> nice guys, Alan. <laughs> you've, got good you've got good company. The only way that I could make any difference as a minister in Britain is as part of a revolutionary government. The first thing I'd have to do is to sack all the, all the present government. That's the first thing. Get rid of all of them and replace them with the workers' government. Now, you see, the situation is far worse than what Shireen just said. It's infinitely worse than what you just said. Because now with this, it was bad enough before, as you correctly said, but now with this coronavirus, I mean, the situation is desperate. Uh, many uh, established theatres, old established theatres, concert halls, opera houses, ballet and so on, are threatened with closure, with complete bankruptcy, because how can they uh, work? Even if they open, theoretically, they, they might open the, the theatre. Yeah, but how can they ma maintain a, a theatre with uh, social distancing? They imagine it's not possible. Something like the Globe Theatre, this marvellous theatre on the South right. Bank, which is based on Shakespeare's theatre. So it's been a big success. It's got a huge number of people who go to that theatre. It's threatened with closure, they've said. Yeah. Either we get help from the government or we will be bankrupt. They will be bankrupt, of course. Even the Royal Opera House, which I sometimes go to, I'm a fanatic of classical music, by the way, an absolute fanatic of classical music, but uh, it's threatened with closure. I don't think that will happen, but, but many, many smaller theatres will undoubtedly will have to close, which will impoverish the cultural life of, of, the, of the people of this country. It's criminal. <clears throat> it's criminal. <clears throat> it shows the criminal nature of the capital system. And frankly... It's only a socialist policy that could save these theatres. And you ask, what will they do? Well, look, the question is this. Art, culture, music was always the monopoly of, of a minority, a privileged minority. Many people actually, if you speak to them, I mentioned classical music, and many people will say, well, no, I don't like classical music. What they mean is they've never heard it. They never had the opportunity. And they think furthermore, oh, no, this is not for me. This is for rich people. This is for middle class people, you know. And so it is. So it is. I mean, I sometimes I go to the opera, sit in the cheap cheap seats. You could get quite cheap seats upstairs in the gods, as, as, as they say. You see the people coming there with their expensive uh, fur coats and so on. They're not interested in culture or opera or music. They come there to show off their posh clothes and so on. Yeah, but that was the case in Russia, you know before this man behind you took power, before, before 1917. Well, I'll tell you something. I studied, as you, as you mentioned earlier, I studied in Moscow University, 1970. That was a long time, 50 years ago. Good God. How time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Right. 50 years ago, before you were born. But, uh, uh, you know, and I, I went to the Bolshoi, you know, the famous Bolshoi uh, Theatre, to watch uh, opera and ballet once a week. And for the best, it's, you know how much I paid? One dollar. One dollar. You tried to go to the ball, said, Bali. No, I couldn't afford to go now. It's impossible. 
And the Bolasa in the early days of the revolution was packed full, you can see pictures of this, full of ordinary workers, peasants, soldiers in their overcoats and so on, listening to this marvellous music. They'd never seen anything like it, you know. Uh, uh, symphony orchestras went to the factories to play concerts in the factories and so on. That was the case. In other words, the, the doors were open for people for the first time in their lives to participate in culture. Of course, uh, they were held back by the extreme backwardness and poverty of, of Russia. That's not the matter. And the Stalinist counter-revolution, which did tremendous damage and so on. But it didn't complete, even that didn't completely eliminate the enormous cultural advances of the, of the Russian Revolution. You know, Great uh, writers and uh, uh, artists, and particularly uh, musicians and, and composers like uh, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, Khachaturian, and so on and so forth. So, so that there is, a, that's the only possibility. And therefore, if I was Minister of Culture, it would, I, would, I would only accept being Minister, or rather, Commissar of Culture. Commissar of Culture, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I would only accept being a Commissar of Culture in, in a socialist government. Why? Because that would give me the means, the, the, the specific means of really, of really developing culture. Well, there'd be no problem with finance there. There was right. never any problem in the Soviet Union. Although Russia was a poor country, they never had any problem giving money to the arts. They gave a lot of money, and science as well, of course, which they carried to a very high level. Now, that, of course, was, was not socialism in, in the real sense of it, but it was what we would call a caricature of uh, socialism. Yeah, but a caricature is based some resemblance to the, uh, to the original uh, item. So, therefore, there again, we come back to the point that the problems, it's a problem of life really now, and that will be the case in all countries, probably in, 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 in Iran also. It's a life and death question. You know, you can have uh, capitalism, which is barbarism, and the destruction of culture, and the destruction of civilization, or you can have a new form, a higher form of human civilization, which is socialism. There is no other choice for the arts. It's a, it's a life and death, it, literally it's a life and death question. I think even people in Britain, uh, like dancers and musicians and so on, and actors who have never been particularly interested in politics, I think even now it's beginning to register in their minds, good God, this is serious, we must do something about it. And therefore it's the beginning therefore of political activism. Mm -hmm. And I would say to anyone in Iran in particular that's any budding artist or musician and so on. My friend, if you seriously want to defend the arts in Iran, then you must fight for the change. Great. Commissar uh, Alizadeh, what would you... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? It's a Commissar Alizadeh. Uh, yes, I, I mean, uh, that's a, this is an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I think also just to add to, to what Alan said, uh, I think uh, without a socialist transformation, uh, it will be difficult to, to, to save art. Uh, and what, what, what is needed, I mean, the first thing we, would, would need, which, would we, which we would have to do would be to lower working hours, yes. to free up time yeah. for people to participate in politics, in the arts, uh, people to have time to go to the theater because uh, I mean, you come home at, uh, I don't know what, 8 o'clock in the evening, is, you're completely tired, you're dead, right. who, has, who has the energy to go to the theater? Uh, and also, there's a question of finance, as Alan said, uh, which means you, you, you need to raise living standards, uh, but also you need to, I think also you need to break the monopolies who control art today. Also, every single sphere of art are controlled, even the theaters uh, are controlled by by big monopolies today, music and so on, which 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 plays no no role whatsoever. They the only role they play is to take the artist and uh, monopolize their work and sell it for for as much as mon money as possible. But once you break the monopolies, first of all, you will help the artists, uh, and at the same time, uh, and and break the 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 kind of rigid schema that the monopolies apply. For instance, in music, it's clear record companies and so on, they, they hold particular artists because they think, okay, this is good. And these are the only people they, they, they uh, advertise and promote and hold other people back just for, for, for simple economic reasons. But all of these interests would be gone with the breaking of the monopolies. 
could lower the price of art and you could increase its access. And also I would say that uh, one of the, uh, uh, the key things at the same time is a, is a focus on education is to raise the cultural level of people on all fields, on the field of science and all, which, which would also uh, add to the understanding of, of, of you know, that the, the people would learn to understand the language of art, so to say. As Alan said, people have never heard this. Well, so it's, even when they hear it, it's, it's difficult to, to, un, to recognize. Right? So, uh, so that, I think, also would be one of the things that, uh, that a, socialist, you know, a, a socialist revolutionary plan forward for, for art would focus on as a, as a first, open, like first stage of, of things. Okay. Before you can then get in, in, into other things. Great. Shiz, I know you have some questions, but uh, now it's, I think, good time to ask you, uh, revolutionary guys, uh, that <laughs> actually um, looking to the history uh, for some artists that actually they were more like individuals. They were not, they were not like uh, political artists, uh, party artists. They didn't have good time in revolutionary time. You know, you, what you say, they didn't have really uh, too much freedom. They, they didn't have their own autonomy to create culture, create art, you know. Uh, when I'm talking about revolutionaries uh, against them, like you, you were talking about Soviet Union. I also studied in the Soviet, uh, not in the Soviet, in socialist country. Uh, and uh, if you look at those times, and it's not only Stalin, Actually, the restriction of art was until the end of the era of, uh, you know, uh, socialism, in that kind of socialism, so, or socialist countries. Uh, artists, they had to be in some part of, some kind of particular frame, and they couldn't be really free. Always, uh, party would say, what is the cultural policy, and you should do your work. You, had, you have a fantastic article about Shostakovich. And I hope Shirin, Shirin will translate it to Farsi someday. It is really wonderful. But you are only um, uh, po focusing on Stalin. Yes. But I don't think that's the, that's the uh, realistic picture. It was not only Stalin. I think it started from, from Lenin time. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the way... <laughs> the way uh, I, I mean, Prolet cult, uh, Prolet cult in 1920, they had Congress, Lona Charsky, they had Congress, 8th of October, Lenin wrote about proletarian culture from the Central Committee, how, how they should behave. He said that they should not even think about autonomy. They only can think about uh, what they could participate uh, from the line of uh, Central Committee, you know, and Ministry of Education, uh, and Commissariat of Education, of, uh, excuse me. So, uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, I want to ask is now, after all these years and all, all these experiences we have, from October Revolution, let's say, from com uh, pa Paris Commune, uh, do you now, as revolutionaries, believe that actually culture and artists, they should have their own autonomy? They should be free of your influence in their work. And uh, you shouldn't actually interfere. You should help them to be free, to do whatever they want. Yes, of course, the part I absolutely agree with is that in Soviet Union and in most socialist countries, ex-socialist countries, Culture was, uh, you know, for everyone. Everyone could go to opera. Everyone could go to concert. That's true. Uh, but what about this freedom, please? Yes, well, uh, it, it, it's true what you say about Stalinism. That's true. I, I also studied in Bulgaria in the 1960s. And I had a good friend of mine, friends of mine who were artists. A professional artist, nice people, good friends of mine. And he made his living painting pictures of glorious uh, Bulgarian soldiers, you know, for doing maneuvers, etc. But his, his actual work, I didn't much like it, but that's beside the point. His actual work, which is kind of abstract experimental paintings and so on, he had to keep in secret in his own flat. It would never be, never be sold. Eventually he escaped and went to Canada, I think. I lost contact with him which is very sad. 
Uh, because, of course, it's what two would say. Look, an artist must be allowed to freely express what is in himself or herself without any external pressure, either from uh, the church or the mosque or uh, a totalitarian dictator or the state or the party or Alan Woods. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I wouldn't dream of it because I'm not uh, an expert. I'm not an artist. Artists must be allowed to do their own thing. Some, sometimes the experiments are not, in my opinion, not very, not very successful, but that's just my opinion. Uh, it, it, science only proceeds through experiments, and there are many, many experiments also in science which don't give the, the desired result, but they are, they are progress. You make progress by trial and error, and that's as it should be. Now, you see, I, I must strongly disagree with what you say about Lenin and the Bolsheviks. This is not true. Except to say, the period that you, you know, the, the, the resolution you referred to, you look at the date of it, it's 1920. That was during the Civil War. You know. Civil right. War, which was a very bloody affair, right. in which, yes, the, the Bolsheviks were forced to introduce certain limitations on, on freedom. That's correct. Not just artistic freedom, which people accepted, by the way. And people will accept, the workers will accept certain limitations on their freedoms for a limited time. I'll give you a case in point. In the Second World War, in Britain, was it a so-called democracy? But they introduced certain limitations. People accepted that because they, they understood the need, the priority was to defeat Hitler, and therefore everything else had to take a second. Uh, second. That was the case. Prolet cult, which you mentioned, is a, is a complicated, it's more complicated than what you suggest. Prolet cult was actually a very bad tendency which had a very mechanical view of art. And by the way, Prolet Cult wanted to impose their dictatorship on all art. He wanted the monopoly, which Lenin was not prepared to, to, to give them and so on. That's exactly my point. Who is yeah. Lenin to decide about it? We have um, rev Who is Lenin to decide about culture? That's my point. I no, mean, no, no, the, the, we have the, revolutionary the, yeah. artists. We have also uh, <laughs> radical artists. Of course, I, yes. I do not agree with Prolet cult, but my point yeah. was that interference of Lenin, I, I, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. He, he, oh, right in, in the middle of the war, he's coming with a, a suggestion about culture. And, <laughs> and, and, I mean, I, I, mean, uh, yeah. I know, I, I also agree with you that I understand the time of the war and all these things. But my point is that uh, that if even it is anti-revolutionary thing happening in the society, why shouldn't the artist deal with it? Why should uh, politicians deal with it? Well, there, there is such a thing as counter-revolutionary art as well, you know. But that's a, that's right. another matter. That's another matter. Listen, I think you're being a bit well unfair, but a bit one-sided. One <laughs> If I might be allowed to make a point. Right. right. You t yeah, take, take the whole period of the 1920s in the Soviet Union, in the, the young worker state, you find the most extraordinary flourishing of art of all sorts, all sorts of schools, not just Prolet culture, who still existed, by the way, except yeah. that they weren't allowed to have a monopoly, which is what they were after. There were other schools, the constructivists, and so all these mar marvelous schools. Well, had complete freedom as a matter of fact. And if you read, for example, Trotsky was the second man in the regime after Lenin, wrote a marvelous book which you might, must have read called uh, Literature and Revolution. You must right, have read that book. Right, right. Written at the, at the time in which he's, he actually deals with all these different schools and he, he evaluates it from his own. And he, he modestly says, Well, look, I'm not an expert, but I, I think this, I think that. But it's up to the artists. It's up to the artists. And there was no, they, they, at that period, it was actually, in my opinion, one of the great periods of the flourishing of art, and it did flourish. Art, music, experimental stuff, which Lenin didn't approve of, by the way. Yeah, that's on occasion, true. On, on, on yeah. One, it doesn't matter whether he approved or not. Yeah. On one occasion, yeah. somebody reported to him, and they were short of paper at the time, that they published an edition of one of Mayakovsky, you know, the famous poet, you know. Of course. I think about 100,000 editions of one of his friends. Lenin could be, what the hell are you doing? We haven't got paper. This shouldn't be allowed. But he's pointed out that the workers actually like this stuff. So he, he dropped his and said, well, carry on. Okay. Who cares, carry on. 
There was you no know, the, the 1920s. Oh, you're talking about the Civil War. That's a different matter. In the Civil War, there were that was the end, severe, right. severe right. restrictions on all kinds yeah. of things. But yeah. uh, afterwards, from the period, say 1921, say, up until 1933, approximately, complete freedom. Although it was it was, it was precisely with the Stalinist counter-revolution that the bureaucracy began that clamping down. Okay. Uh, Mayakovsky committed suicide for that yeah. reason in 1931. Many, yeah, yeah, that, that period is disaster, <laughs> uh, of course. But also let's talk about funny things Trotsky said about art. <laughs> Can I say something about Yes, people? of course. Yeah. You go yeah, first. I, was, I, was, I think also, um, I mean, obviously the, the, the idea, or you cannot restrict art. Uh, but I think actually that's precisely what Polit Cult was, was doing, because I know that on the surface is... Uh, is actually portrayed as an artistic movement, but in reality, the whole top leadership were politicians, were right. old uh, revolutionaries who broke, most of them broken with the Bolsheviks, right. and um, and they were they were doing this for for factional reasons. They, you know, they, they actually didn't really manage. They had this idea to impose proletarian art and build build a proletarian culture, and they they completely failed. Um, and instead, they were using it for, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a, um, how do you say, as a political tool, factional tool, and they were getting all the resources from the Ministry of Commissariat of Education, right? Uh, what they said is that no, we should be the commissariat of, so unelected people who are not the artists either, and who do not represent the majority of artists, we should have the monopoly on this on dividing the funds, basically, to art throughout society. And I think in that, sen in that sense, that was a discussion also regarding autonomy, was that, well, uh, you know, you, you monopolize, and, and people who were actually in the Commissariat of Education, who were, who were on the right wing, people like Luna Charsky, were a, a part of this faction. They were supporting this, and they were channeling money, <laughs> money to build up this movement. It was a political thing, in my opinion. I think it wasn't in any way a real true expression of artists coming from below. Uh, but on the other hand, it was like a disguise, actually, a guise for, 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 to, to wage a factional struggle, which is exactly the, the opposite of what we want to achieve with the liberation of art and Absolutely. all of these things. I, I, I agree with and, you. And, and, just, and just one more thing is that although we do, a, although we do agree that we should not restrict art, but I think also we have to... Uh, also to reserve the right and duty to comment on art and analyze art as Marxists and, and as, so, you know, just to say that the, we don't want to repress art doesn't mean that we don't say anything about art and the character it has and so on. You see, you can criticize art as a, as a person, of course, art is for everyone, but you yeah. influencing, influencing art based on your criticism, that's something else. Let's divide these two things. Of yeah. course, but like you're using your power to power to <clears throat> let me it just just for fun of it. Let me just uh, the way Lenin Lenin told Donacharsky how she should he should shut up. <laughs> it's just really funny funny thing. It's on the 30, 31 volume of uh, uh, Lenin's collected work. Uh, he says uh, we see from Izvestia of October eight. This is nineteen twenty uh, that in this address. To the Prolet Cult Congress, Comrade Lunacharsky said said things that uh, that were uh, diametrically uh, opposite to what he and I had agreed upon yesterday. And then he starts his his uh, his thing. You know, <laughs> it's like a you know big guy. You said something yesterday, and now today I'm reading something else in the newspaper. You know, and then and then he he. I mean, Lunacharsky was dealing with it. I'm, I, I agree with your points, of course, we are thinking the same way, but the way they were dealing with, with culture and politics, I don't think it was correct. Because if, even if Lunacharsky was making mistake, why shouldn't that government let, the, let Lunacharsky as a commissar of education to make that mistake? I mean, the leader of the revolution comes to, you know, commissar of education and says, okay, you said something else yesterday, I'm reading something else here, you know. It's like... But, listen, do you, do you not accept, mm. do you not accept what I just said, that for the whole of the night, from 1921, at the end of the Civil War, 
Mm. Right after 1933, there was complete and absolute artistic freedom in the Soviet Union. Do you accept I that? I do accept that. Right, I do so accept that. So that's that. context. Uh, well, that's this is the kind of critique by loving you here. guys. You're yeah. dealing here with an exceptional situation during right. the Civil War when, as I said, certain restrictions on freedom were undoubtedly introduced. Right, right, right. For an emergency, she said, but that wasn't the norm. The norm was afterwards, which you saw. And that was a great flourishing of, of art, music, and culture. It's undeniable. Yeah, I'm uh, Just let me point out that uh, this kind of critique is not against what we, what we are thinking altogether. This is actually for making it better. And it's not about what was great in, uh, you know, in the, uh, after revolution and how, how many possibilities artists have. But also we cannot deny what happened to Meyerhold, what happened to Prokofiev, what, to, what happened to Shostakovich. But, but, but that was under Stalin. Yeah, but let's say, what, what about Trotsky? Uh, Trotsky has this famous, uh, this is not actually critique, this is just something like asking you guys. Uh, Trotsky said that art in museum is like, uh, if I if I translate it correctly, is like in the concentration camp. Concentration camp. That's right, right. Right. Okay. Imagine you guys, since you are Tr Trotsky's, uh, uh, what would you say today with all this freedom of uh, expression, right? Telegram. Anyone can be out and uh, n not anymore in the museum and claim that they are artists. Right. This is my this is my question. How how you how you could say such a thing and then today is it possible that everyone just not in the museum anymore can be in everywhere, but anyone sings it means that is artist. It's a singer. You love opera. How would you uh, explain this kind of revolutionary thoughts of Trotsky by now in twenty first century? I don't understand the question. Hamid, do you? No, I'm not quite sure I follow now. I think it's a wrong suggestion from Trotsky that yeah. says museum is a place no. to... Okay, no, if no. it is right... Look, compare let, it to let, today's let, stuff. Let, let me explain. Okay. Me. Let, me, let me explain. For most people live in bad houses, they hear bad music on the radio, they eat bad food, they go to work in ugly factories. That's their life. That's real life for the majority of people, okay? Then at weekends, some of them might go to a museum or an art gallery where they see beautiful things which have nothing whatsoever to do with their real life. In that sense, art is imprisoned. Yes, okay. art is the art is, is, is in a concentration. Yeah, that's what Trotsky meant. I think, you, I think you didn't understand what he meant. That's what he meant. And that's absolutely correct. It's the, it's the property of a privileged minority. Most people feel completely alienated from art. And that's partly the fault of the artists themselves. Completely alienated. They think it's nothing to do with us, and so on. Uh, the point you made is an entirely separate point. It's nothing to do with it. The fact that today there's modern technology, people can do that. But even that, you know, has got severe limits. Yes, it's true, young, youngsters have got access to internet, they can play their guitars and so on. Yes, but there's a limit to that. In reality, they will find that there's a ceiling which they will never penetrate. They will never advance, they will never get on. In the end, they'll be forced to give up and get some, some kind of a job. That because exactly art, because as, as Hamid said, the art galleries, these concentrations are, are still in the hands of a tiny minority. The Saatchi and Saatchi brothers and so on in London. Right. right. Uh, but I, I you, meant by that that the, it's, art, uh, yeah, the artists themselves are also, also partly to blame. Right. Look, one of my, I think my favorite artists, I lived in Madrid for some time, as you know, and I frequently went to the Prado Museum, which is marvelous, is Goya. Right. But the painters are mm -hmm. that. Is, 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 is real revolutionary art. It's not propaganda, it's revolutionary art. The man was expressing his feelings about the real world that he lived in. Now you compare the early paintings of Goya, which are full of sunlight and dancing and happy people, and so to the black period, which, by the way, he painted on a wall for his own side. He never intended it to be seen by anybody. Mm. Now you can see it, but it's great art. 
all these pictures of the Napoleonic, the, the massacres of uh, in Madrid with Napoleon. This is art by a person that, that's involved in the, in the struggles of, of, of his people, if you like, against. Or take Pablo Picasso's Guernica, which is a marvelous art. And that again, it's not propaganda, that's genuine art. It's great art, but it reflects his reaction towards the Spanish Civil War. Now, of course, we live in the present world. To give just one example, in the, in the, in the Congo, at least five million men, women, and children were slaughtered in the most brutal manner, you know. Mm. Or you got the, the criminal invasion of Iraq and so on, the, the disaster in Syria and so on. What do our artists, our British artists, produce? An unmade bed. For Christ's sake, I do that every morning. An unmade bed. That's all they got to say about the sufferings of humanity. An unmade. There was a Japanese woman, you know, a few years back that uh, she produced a work of art. It was uh, cigarette uh, ashtrays full of cigarette butts and ashes, you know. And it was put in, the, in, in, in an art gallery in London. The cleaning lady next morning came with a brush and pan and swept it up. That was the best bit of art criticism I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, oh, should we tell these artists not to do what they do? I wouldn't dream of it. It's not, none of my business. I'm not an artist. Are we not entitled to express an opinion of that as an example of what I consider to be the, the bankruptcy of, of, of capitalism? Yes, we are entitled to make a, 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 such a statement. And I think we'd be justified in doing so. Okay. No, I, I'm in, I, I'm in, look, art must express whatever people want to express. It could be uh, water lilies, you know, like the impress. I don't, that's, that's wonderful. I like that art. It's wonderful, you know. Maybe nothing to do with politics. Or okay. society. Okay. Yes, but surely the greatest art must be somehow related to the reality, to the reality of, of, of people, or real people and so on. I think so, I think so. And in its highest expression, yes, that can be re genuine revolutionary art, which I would, I would like to see to, to be developed. Great. Yes. Jean -Jean, uh, I'm sorry, I just, uh, uh, please, you just ask your question. Okay, <laughs> I just uh, came up with another question, but uh, I think it's uh, somehow connected to the question our comrade wanted to ask. Yes. Um, you talk you talk about um, the ills that capitalism imposes on our lives and art and culture, and you talk about saving art from capitalism. You also mentioned uh, a time that of current time, that yeah. um, art is uh, the property of a few. And you talk about another time that uh, art can be, art and culture can be property of all. Yes. Uh, what I want to ask is that, uh, is there a place uh, that we, that you see for art in between these two? that uh, actually art can uh, proactively contribute to this, uh, say, uh, revolution. Uh, or uh, as our, our comrade wanted to ask, uh, okay. do you think that alternative art exists? Do I think that alternative art exists? Now that's an interesting. <laughs> as, a matter, as a matter of fact, I, I do. That's great. I, I am, I am firmly convinced that it exists, but unfortunately it, it's never shown, you know. You got, look, there are millions of young people, for example, that uh, play a guitar and uh, sing songs and so on, and write music. My daughter uh, actually wrote music for a time in this way. I thought it was uh, good, but you see, that's the, that's the point. Because art remains under the firm control of big business, of the bankers and capitalists and so on, who, treats, who treat art as a commodity. Furthermore, they treat artists as a commodity too. Mm. This isn't just painting that's bought and sold. The artists are bought and sold as well and become corrupt, like Damien Hurst and this gang in London. They're, they're very wealthy people. You know? they're, they're well integrated into the system. Yeah, But then for every one of those... There's a thousand or ten thousand 
struggling artists and struggling young people who are striving for new ideas and new, I might or I might like or dislike them, that's beside the point. But it does exist, but it's never given the chance to develop. And under this society, it will never be given the chance to develop. Look at poor old Banksy, you know Banksy? Of course. I, think I was in Bristol a, as well, so I saw... I think, I, can... I, I think he's a good artist, and also yeah. his art is a commentary. Right. It is a denunciation. <laughs> yeah, but what do they do? They strip, they strip it off the walls and they sell it for huge sums of money, you know. Right. So even that becomes eventually commercialized. So that's the point. It, it is a very interesting, a tantalizing view of what would be possible. There's a, an immense possibility of un, untapped, there's an immense reservoir of untapped human talent available in society. Yes, but within the straitjacket of this system, it will never get a chance to develop. You're going to go, so, go so far, and then you, you hit a brick wall. Right. Schillinger, uh, or, or also, uh, may I also connect your question to, to this, that actually for the... Um, conclusion of our discussion or conversation um, let's go to this alternative art art you as revolutionaries uh, always you have alternatives right and uh, your point of view of <laughs> or we should <laughs> uh, actually um, what what would be the characteristics of this alternative art In your point of view now then now then you ask me, me as a revolution to tell you what, what the answer is. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I cannot know what it is. It is right. it's something, it's invisible. It's an invisible potential. It, but that it exists, I don't doubt that it exists. I don't doubt. Okay. What form of it, it, it will take, I don't know. I have the faintest idea. The future, the future will answer that question. Okay. What I do know, and we, I think we can agree on this, is that art must be free, it must be free of uh, ex external pressures and limitations, and people must be allowed to experiment. That was so good answer, Alan. I have <laughs> <laughs> However, however I, I hasten to ask, as, as you well know, that not all experiments are successful. Right. You know? Some will be, and then only time will tell what, will, what art will survive. It's like, in a way, it's like natural selection and evolution, you know. Time will tell what will survive and what what will endure ultimately. In a hundred years' time, when people look back and say, "Oh, that's that was rubbish," and so yeah, but this was interesting. So the human race will decide that question in the future. And in the same way as I've got no intention of telling artists what to do, I've no intention of telling what the future generations are going to do either. That will depend on them. I'm quite happy to leave it to them. Great. Have you done? So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You go first. You go first. Um, so, what about uh, art as a means of struggle? Ah, it can be. It can be a very powerful means of struggle. <clears throat> Again, I go back to the Russian Revolution. I mean, Mayakovsky. Do you know Russian, by the way? What, 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 what country did you study in? In Yugoslavia. I studied in Belgrade. In Belgrade. You speak Serbian? Yes, yeah, Serbian and Croatian. Oh, I'm very, it's the same. It's the same. It's the don't same tell them. Like, don't tell them. The same. Not only that, Kakoste. <laughs> yes. Kakoste. Kakoste. No, no, no. No, no. No, Yes, uh, it, it, the Russian Revolution. I mean, look at Mayakovsky. Right. Marvelous revolutionary poet. And his poetry was listened to by thousands of people. Same in the Spanish Revolution, the Spanish Civil War. You had uh, great poets like uh, the, 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 who, who, who read in the, the poetry in front, and that inspired uh, people to fight. Yes, or even the posters. Poster posters are not usually considered to be great art. Right. Normally, they're not great art. But yeah. in the case of the Russian Revolution, the the constructivist posters, I think they're if they're not great art, they're certainly very good art, True. and that inspired. People to fight. It was mar marvelous, and it was something new, startlingly, surprisingly new. That was an experiment that worked, and it's lasted. I think it's a pe even people who are not interested in politics as well, but they put it on their wall because they find it uh, beautiful and attractive, which it is. Yes, but it's very powerful. It's got a powerful message. You know. We're going to have a summer school, which I hope you'll join us in uh, 
a few weeks' time. That would be uh, wonderful. We were just discussing with Hamid what uh, publicity to put. <laughs> uh, we considered different things, but we couldn't find anything better than this revolutionary post. I think it's a woman with a big megaphone. Right, right, right. Shouting a slogan. That's, right. that's, that's art which still has something alive. Something exciting to say to us a hundred years later. Now that must say something. The fact that this is right. How long an unmade bed or a, a, a pickle shark, an, an ashtray full of cigarettes is going to last, or a pickle shark? Yes, I am not quite sure about that. We shall see. Great. Have you done with you? Sorry. Have well, you, uh, no, I. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't have much to add. <laughs> it's been a very interesting discussion. Right, so, there. it is really nice. It, it, it will continue. No? Oh, it I hope continue. so. These are, these are big subjects. Right, much. exactly. But also, we really hope that you continue writing about art and culture, Alan, and uh, it is really great uh, reading your work. So, thank I'll you for my, that. I'll do my best to thank you for your interest. <laughs> Thank you, above all, for, saying, for, for translating. I mean, that must be very difficult. It's very difficult, isn't it? To translate? Yeah. Is it difficult um, to translate my, my works? I enjoy it, and oh, it's well, well, not that difficult. Well, that's very kind of you. Teshakur, you see, I must learn. I, must learn. <laughs> I, did, I didn't think of starting, but... Actually, I'm too, I'm yesterday too I was I was looking at at your articles uh, and and uh, we were looking together and I said, look, uh, as I mentioned, Shostakovich is really a great great uh, article, and I hope Shirin would soon translate that one too. <laughs> yes, you translated Beethoven, I suppose, did you? No, <laughs> no, it's, a, it's his anniversary, you know. Yeah, I, and I mean, this is the really interesting thing about you and. Uh, there are not many politicians and theoreticians that actually this they're writing this way nowadays about culture and art and well uh, that, and that's very sad and it's yeah. it, it does it, it's not good because as a Marxist I think Marxism covers the whole spectrum of human existence and human culture and human thought for thousands of years you know and sometimes you're quite right. Some people who are so-called leftists, so-called so-called Marxists, are very narrow, which is not good. It wasn't true of the, the great Marxists. The Marx himself was very interested in culture, and yeah. you find in, in, even in Capital many, many references to, to literature, to Cervantes, to Shakespeare, to the Greek writers, and so on. And the same with Trotsky, Lenin, also. They were they were cultured people. Stalin yeah. was not. A, Stalin was not. He was uh, as ignorant as a pig, and that's why that's why he didn't. Like, that's why he tried to impose himself. The others were not. They were cultured. You could agree with them or disagree with them, but they were cultured men and women. Very cultured. Okay. So, which I is what? Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so I suggest uh, uh, we took so much of your time. Thank you very much. But uh, oh, my, my pleasure. My but pleasure. but I think also if there is something that you want to add for the end of this uh, conversation, please. No, 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 not really. You yeah. know, a very good friend of mine died recently. He was a oh. worker, construction worker, and he had a very, very nice man from Glasgow, Scotsman, brought up from a very poor family, self-educated. You know, he could recite uh, the Roboyat of Omar Khayyam oh. by heart from start to finish. Because the translation by Fitzgerald, which I think is, I don't know person, but unfortunately, I would love to know a person I've got the greatest possible admiration for person culture and literature and art, and I have the greatest admiration for comments like yourself, like yourselves that are cont continuing to struggle. And you have uh, all our support. Anything we can do to help. Thank you, you very much. I Thank hope you. one of these days to visit you. I would, I oh, would love would to. Like, love, love that too. <laughs> to have a look at all the, the, the cultural things of the past. Beautiful. You see, it's a tragedy. People in the West don't really know. They, they, go, they don't know about uh, Persian culture, and so they don't know yeah. what a great culture this was. They only know that barbarian Alexander the Great, the so-called great Alexander the Barbarian, right. that destroyed Perse Persepolis, you know, that, that's, that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> don't get into these. They know, they know <laughs> what? what? No, 
nothing. I was just joking. <laughs> Hamid, would you would you say something for the end of our conversation? No, again, thank you very much for having uh, me and us. Yeah. I would say it's You're been it's been very very interesting to participate. Yeah. Not at all, as you said, you know, taking up our time. It was yeah. a pleasure. So hopefully, we can do something like this also in the future. We hope yeah. so. Yeah. Yes, we, it was also very much my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And if ever you have the chance of coming to London when this coronavirus thing is over, yeah, we're actually over. Exposure, we'll Thank be very, very pleased much. to receive you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely.